An all new five, a major organized crime bust. 23 people under arrest now accused of stealing guns and cash. Today, police revealed four organized crime groups are wreaking havoc. From aggravated robbery to kidnapping, burglary, and more. Let's take a look at this. New pictures from court documents in this case. These are a few of the people who have been charged. And investigators say the money, tens of thousands of dollars, is all stolen. Welcome to this episode of Chatting with Stacks. I'm your host, Bill Stacks, and today I got Chris Carroll. What's Bill, up, what's Chris? going on? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. Yeah, so you have a really interesting story. You're here to explain some things to me. Where it all started for you. Yeah, let's 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 do it. You know, I'm ready. I'm ready to do it. Yeah. So so where were you born and raised? You know, I grew up as a kid in the Midwest in, uh, you know, Chicago, Wisconsin area, but I came out to Vegas when I was just in junior high. So uh, except for a, f- a five year stint in San Diego, I've, I've pretty much been in Vegas my whole life. So it's definitely uh, it's definitely my hometown. And I still live here. What was your first experience on getting involved with law enforcement? Was that your career choice when you were younger? Do you want to do that? Yeah, or? you know, uh, I had two uncles uh, when I was teenager and they were both uh, L.A. County sheriffs sheriff's department. So I would go on ride alongs with those guys, you know, and I'm like 14, 15 years old, very impressionable age. And uh, I'd go out with those guys and I was just like, oh man, this is, this is for me. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't really see doing anything else from that point on. So that was, that was what I wanted to do. And, you know, for me, police work was kind of like a round peg and a round hole. It just, it just fit with me. It went with me. It was right for my personality. Uh, I like doing it. Uh, I like to think I was good at it. Um, so, you know, it went it went well and, and I really couldn't see myself doing much else. When you first joined the force, w- was there any major events that happened before this major event? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's I mean, this is pretty, this is definitely the one that's going to stick around, you know, for the rest of my life. But, uh, you know, out here in Vegas, there's always always things happening. Uh, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, you know, I don't want to, when I say there's a lot of crime, there is a lot of crime, but it's, it's, it's still a relatively safe city to walk the streets, so to speak. But we do have our bad sections of town, you know, we're, we're not really that small a city anymore. There's 2 million people here. Um, a lot of things happen and just the nature of the city. Um, and you get a lot of celebrities rolling through or a lot of celebrities that live here and, you know, when you're on the police department, you're constantly mixing it up with these people, not always in a bad way, a lot of times in a good way. But I mean, you work on filming sets for movies and um, there's interesting things happening. And, you know, I worked undercover in Vice for a few years and, you know, it was there was just never really a dull moment. So, you know, I did it for 25 years and uh, you know, I was kind of fortunate in that I started when I was 21. So, you know, the way things were set up here is once you did 25 years, you could leave with a full retirement, regardless of your age. And I, I'll admit, by the time 25 years was up, I'd, I'd pretty much had it. I, you know, it had run its course. Uh, I went hard for 25 years and I was I was ready to get out of it. And uh, of course, once you get out of it, after you spend a little time now, I kind of miss it. But um, yeah. the fact is, it's sort of a young man's sport. And, you know, when you, when you, it's like playing pro sports, when you age out, you age out. So it was time to go. And, uh, you know, it was good for me and I'm, I'm glad I did it. What are some of the names of, of the celebrities that you ran across during your time? Is there oh, I uh, run into Mike Tyson under uh, a few different circumstances. Uh, uh, my guys, when I had a domestic violence unit, you know, I left as a lieutenant. So I was in charge of domestic violence, sexual assault missing persons. Uh, you know, we did Floyd Mayweather's arrest. Uh, we responded to a host of uh, professional athletes uh, uh, all the time in a wide, ver- both as victims, usually as victims, really, for pr- professional athletes, um, sometimes as suspects for various crimes, um, large crimes and small crimes. Um, so, you know, everybody comes here to party, all these people with money, you know, athletes and movie stars and everything that they, when they get their chance, they come to Vegas. Yeah. Um, so everybody comes through here and, and you also got a lot of people that are just, um, just the opposite. They're just kind of drifters. They're looking to stay away from the law. They're looking to stay low. They figure I can go to Vegas and probably blend in. There's so much going on there. Uh, harder to find people in big cities with a lot of stuff going on. So we get a little bit of everything here. 
Yeah, but you have to register if you're a felon when you come out. If you move here. Yeah. If you, if you move here, you do. Um, matter of fact, the only – maybe it's changed since I've been uh, working, but it used to just be 48 hours, which is not that long. So you'd get uh, a lot of people in violation of that. Uh, you wouldn't always act on it, but it was always a tool you can use if you had somebody you're trying to keep your eyes on. It's a charge, right? That's a sure. charge. Itself. Yeah. Ex felon failure to register. Yeah. Then does it carry jail time? Uh, probably, probably. You know, it's it's up to the judge at the end of the day, but it's it's definitely something you could you do a little time for first offense. Probably, you know, minor league minor league stuff. You know, misdemeanor stuff. Um, might end you the first time you're probably doing a night in jail realistically, but after that's going to start adding up. Did you ever run into um, Suge Knight? Oh, no, he's in prison now. No, so did you ever run into him before this situation happened yes. out in Vegas? Yes. Uh, uh, when I was in charge of the domestic violence unit, uh, I got a call that Suge Knight had been involved in a uh, pretty serious domestic violence incident. And uh, I knew it would be pressworthy. So I talked to, I, I got a hold of that. It was a young officer. Uh, who had responded to that. And I said, hey, tell me everything because I'm probably going to have to talk to the press. I want to make sure I get it right. So he had, we had gotten a call of a woman being beaten, uh, literally like in a street corner type situation, which is kind of rare because, you know, domestic violence usually happens in the home and, and things. And it's, it's you don't see it uh, happen. Nobody usually sees it happen. But in this, in this case, it was out in a public place and there happened to be an, a patrol officer there uh, very close when the call came out. So he got there in, in probably less than a minute. And Suge Knight was literally on top of this woman and had a knife in his hand and was getting ready to stab her. And uh, the, the young cop pulled out his gun, told him to drop it. And Suge Knight looked over and he did. And he dropped it. And it was his lucky day because I, I think that could have gone bad for him real quick. And uh, so he got arrested uh, for that. Now, I didn't personally see Suge that night, uh, but I ended up doing a press conference on it uh, later on. So since uh, I, I never ran into him face to face uh, after the Tupac incident. What did you ever have any run ins with Tupac before this happened? So, can you, I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Did, I couldn't. Hear did it. you did you have any run ins with Tupac in Las Vegas? No, nope, I had never happened? seen him. Be had never seen him before the night. Did you hear about the fight that happened in the casino that night? Uh, I did. And uh, to tell you the truth, uh, when that call came out, it wasn't really a big deal. Now, you got to now in hindsight. Yeah. In hindsight, it had a lot to do with a lot of things. But at the time, you know, uh, it was a Mike Tyson fight night. And a Mike Tyson fight night was the biggest night there is in Vegas. It's kind of like the Super Bowl, but it happens about four times a year. And when uh, when Mike Tyson fought, every gangster, thug, pimp, whore on the entire West Coast came to Vegas on those nights. They were they were unbelievable. And you know what? Since since Mike's retired, no one else has really had that happen since. No one no one really brought him in. You know, Mayweather did a little bit. But there's nothing before or since what would happen like when, when Mike Tyson was fighting. So it's never quite it's never quite come around like that again. But those nights were always huge nights for, for the cops. You know, it was going to be a big night. Um, and that was, you know, so it was a big night going into it. So you start as the night progresses, you start running into problems, 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 all kind of trouble. Now, given given that whole gravity of that situation and you've got the entire Las Vegas strip, the call comes out, a fist fight in the casino. Nobody's really injured. I mean, yeah, beat up, yeah, but nobody's shot, stabbed, laying in blood, nothing like that. And yeah. basically after the fight, uh, security shows up and everybody splits. So it's done. There's really nothing even to go through. It's like a fight happened and now it's done and everybody's gone. You know, there's not there's not a lot to do. You know, like I said, as it turns out, historically, it turns out to be a significant fight. But uh, at the time, it didn't really mean hardly anything. So what was your day like that day? Like, did you uh, go so in the I was morning? 
swing shift, which is like three in the afternoon till one in the morning. So I was a, uh, I was a sergeant at the time. So as a sergeant and, and bike squad, when I say bike, I mean, bicycles, not, not motorcycles. Um, so I had a squad of officers, about 12 officers who worked for me and we would go out and there was also another squad working that night because it was a, it was a weekend night and it was a Mike Tyson night. Um, so there's two squads working. I was the only sergeant working. So typically the sergeant rides alone and all of the uh, officers ride in pairs. And that's what was happening that night. Um, so I was, uh, uh, you know, it's relatively, it's things aren't too bad before the fight because it's still early and everybody's kind of gearing up for the fight. So uh, when the Tyson fight started, um, that was the night he fought uh, Bruce Seldon that night, uh, a one rounder. And uh, it's funny because when, when the fight's going on, it's like the world stops. Nothing, yeah. nothing happens like while the fight's in progress. Nothing's the world stops. So, uh, so of course, nothing happened during the fight. And then as soon as the fight lets, lets out, things start going downhill. So, uh, and that was, that was typical of every one of those nights. And it was typical that night. So I don't remember exactly what time the, the, uh, the, the fist fight in the MGM well, I call it a fight. It was really just a beat down. It was really just like a five on one beat down is all it was. Yeah. Um, so, so that happened earlier in the night sometime. And then, uh, you know, various things are going on throughout the night. Nothing. You're, you're having to show up. So the two pairs of cops, you're having to show up to each incident, right? Yeah. Uh, not every incident, you know, there's, there's like 24 cops out there working, so I can only show up to so much. But I, you know, I'm I'm in charge of kind of overseeing the whole thing. If there's something significant going on, somebody significant in trouble, anything like somebody gets hurt, you know, I need to go out to those type of situations. And uh, I was I was outside of the MGM on my bike uh, when things started. Uh, did you want to go in? Did you want to go right into yeah. that part right now? Yeah, yeah, you could. Okay. okay. So I'm outside of my bike and, and uh, uh, just for people who aren't familiar with Vegas. So, so the fight was at the MGM, which is on the strip. Um, I was outside the, the MGM on my bike um, in an area right next door where things were shady. You know, you had kind of a shady crowd and a, and a, and a lot of people and potential for things to turn. And it's right outside the fight. So I was over there and uh, I heard uh, two officers uh, come on the radio and start yelling that their shots fired. I can hear right away that they were, you know, there was excitement in their voices. And that was at uh, Flamingo and Koval, which is maybe, a, a, you know, like a mile and a quarter and a mile and a half from where I was at. Uh, they put out that the, the, the shots had been fired at Flamingo and Koval. So those guys were in a parking structure on their bikes. So they're about five floors up in a parking structure, but you know, a parking structure is open air. So you can hear and see, as long as you go to the edge of the building, you can hear and see what's going on down below. So yeah. they didn't see the shots fired, but they heard them. Um, so they, they rode their bikes, uh, you know, so they can see what's going on. And as soon as they look out there, they see an entourage of like five cars all fleeing from the area in the same direction. Now they don't know who is shot, who, which, you know, where the bullets came from, where the bullets landed, nothing. All they see is all of these cars racing away. So they, they go in pursuit of like the five cars, but it takes them a minute or two to get down there. Cause they've got like five floors to drive their bikes down to yeah. get down there and the cars are already leaving. So they take off in pursuit of them. And you know, it's, it's, it's funny down there. Like when you chase a car on a bike, they can't necessarily just step on it and disappear because there's too much traffic. So it's yeah. not like they're chasing them on the freeway where the car's just going to leave them in the dust. The car is kind of held up by traffic. So it's almost an even race, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so they're on bicycles and they're a block or two back from these cars and, if, and they're heading towards the strip. Now, of course, as you get closer to the strip, the traffic gets a little worse all the time. So or originally they're able to, to get away from that scene pretty quick, um, but it's only about two, three blocks to the strip. So they're heading to the strip on, uh, on Flamingo and they put that call out. So I, I started on my bike north on the strip, which takes me towards that direction. So I'm going out there on my bike. I'm going as fast as I'm able to. And I, I can go wrong at a pretty good clip on, on a bicycle. And, uh, 
you know, they're still chasing these guys. They're putting out their location. And I realize we're getting closer and closer to each other. So when they get to the strip, and when I say they, they mean the, the entourage and everybody, they hang, a, uh, they hang a left, which is southbound. I'm going northbound. So now I know we're literally, we're heading towards each other. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking, I don't know how I'm going to even stop these guys on my bike. I don't know if I can stop them. I'm on a bike. Um, they're already running for the cops. But what are you going to do? You just do what you can do. So I, I was heading towards the direction. Well, when we got to uh, an intersection uh, at Harmon Avenue, which right now is where uh, City Center is, which is a very large complex uh, uh, over there over there on the Strip. I'm trying to think of, uh, of where Cosmopolitan is and so forth. And it wasn't there then, but the street was still there. So Harmon and Koval was there. And when they hung a left, I, we kind of reached that intersection literally at the same time. So they hung a left right in front of me. And what happened is when they did that, the car spins out. You can see the tires right there. It's funny. I was looking at the background. Yeah. Um, they had two flat tires. The tires were flat from smashed into a curb when they were getting out of there. You can see the huge dents in the rim. The tire is off the bead. There you go right there. Yeah. The yeah. beads are off the tires. So they got two flat tires and they're trying to take the turn too fast. So they spin out like literally in the middle of the intersection and all the other cars pull in. And I came, I laid down my bike. We all came sliding in. And I mean, I'm right on top of them. And you got, you got to remember, I don't know who's who. I don't know who's a shooter, who's not a shooter. So all the doors fly. Everybody comes to a stop. All the doors fly open on the cars and everybody jumps out. And I'm, I thought for sure, I'm like, oh man, we're going to shoot it out right here in the middle of Las Vegas strip. And as stupid as it sounds, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be in so much trouble. I was like, I'm going to get in the middle of a shooting here in the middle of the Las Vegas strip, the worst place on the planet to have a shootout, but it's, it's landed in my lap and I got to, you know, I got to do what I got to do. So I pulled out my gun and I started yelling at every, I'm pointing at everybody. There's like, I, I don't, I couldn't tell you exactly seven, eight guys. I'll get out of the car. And you can tell immediately, like, these are some fairly hard guys. These aren't just guys driving to work or something. They're, they're pretty rough looking. Uh, it, and I'm just, I'm just like, this is, this is a bad, I'm in a bad spot. I, I knew it right away. It was in a bad situation. So I'm trying to point the, the gun at them and I'm yelling, uh, you know, I'm going from person to person, yelling them to get down on the ground. So my thought is I'm just going to lay them down on the ground till some help shows up and then we can start dealing with them. So, and, and I'm waiting for the bullets to start flying. Never happened. No, no shots. So they're so, laying you know, on the ground as you're yelling. Well, and here's, and here's the thing. Some of them lay down. Some of them don't. They're kind of looking at each other. Like, do we listen to this guy? And I think they're trying to size up. Do we run? Do we listen to him? And what do we do? You know, there's kind of like a, there's an uncomfortable, a highly uncomfortable few seconds there. Where we're all kind of looking at each other and everybody's just kind of sizing each other and up going, what exactly is going to happen here? Um, so they kind of, I, I would say they kind of uh, passively went along with the program. Some of them laid down, but a lot of them were kind of like, eh, I'll duck down, but I'm not really going to lay down. And we're doing that. And I'm just trying to scan everybody's, you know, I'm looking for somebody with a gun, which I don't see. But then I noticed when I looked into one of the cars that had pulled up, the one with the smashed tires, there was still a guy sitting in the car. And and I was I was like, OK, that's the guy that's going to shoot me because I'm, I'm like, I can't see him. I can't see his hands. He could be doing anything. He could be loading up a machine gun for all I know. I'm like, yeah. that's the guy I need to concentrate on. So I pointed my gun at the car and I'm coming up on the car and, you know, yelling, yelling at him to show me his hands. He's not doing really anything. He's not even looking at me. But I could tell, you know, he's still alive and he's sitting up and he's facing forward. He's in the passenger seat of the car. So I came right up on the car and uh, I went to grab uh, with my left hand and, and open the door. Well, when I when I went to grab the door handle, I can see right around the door handle, there's bullet holes just like right around the handle. And I'm trying to pull the door and it doesn't feel like it's locked. It feels like it's it feels like it's broken. And I think what happened, I still think this is the, the case. I think the bullets had damaged the, the door mechanism. Uh, not completely, not completely blown it away, but it was it was damaged, like where I couldn't open the door. So I'm tugging and I'm pulling and I'm yelling at him to show me his hands. And he's just kind of sitting there. Is the and window finally, down? You know, is, is the and, window down? 
uh, the window is down. Yeah, so I can see him. I can see him right there, but I can't really see into his lap or anything. And I'm trying to keep a little bit of a distance between me and him so I can back out of there quick if I need to. Well, I, I finally pulled open the door. It popped open. And what happened was, it, it, and it turns out to be that this is Tupac sitting in the car. Tupac is sitting in the car. So I, when I open the door, he's kind of leaning against the door. So that when the door opens out, he just, he slumps out. He just, his body slumps out with the door. Like he can't really move. He's just, his body weight is carrying him out. So I grab him with my left hand. We both kind of went down the pavement together. Well, as soon as I went down the pavement with him, Suge Knight is running up my back and he's yelling at him. He's yelling, pack, pack, and he's, and he's screaming at him. Well, I look back at Suge Knight, and, and I, this guy's like 6'8", 400 pounds, and he's running right up on my back. And, I, you know, I'm thinking, you know, if this dude jumps on my back, it's going to be – I'm in trouble. So I, I turn around, and I point the gun at him. I was like, get away from me, back off. And he would, you know, kind of put – kind of back off for a second, take about 10 steps back, and he's still just yelling, pack, pack. And uh, I could see Tupac is kind of looking at him. But he can't really, he can't really get a blood breath together, and that's when I, I first like I'm get a good look at Tupac, and he's in bad shape. He's uh he's got several torso hits. He's wearing a lot of gold jewelry, and there's he's he's bleeding badly. Uh, his jewelry is covered in blood. Uh, he's got he's got tor like I said multiple torso hits. He can't even really tell where they're from. I think he was also like hitting the hand and the leg. Um, so he's, he's shot up pretty good and, he, and he's got blood coming out of his mouth and nose. And I saw the blood coming out of his mouth and nose. I was like, this guy's probably going to die.